We're on. Oh, we are. We put an item on consent mm -hmm. for a transportation plan. Mm -hmm. Could we get that pulled? Kelly Brennan would like to just ask you guys a quick question for direction, and it will only take a second. She said. So when you say pull, like because um, it's on consent. Okay. Don't so do you want to? Wanna, well, it's not like an official meeting, and okay. we're not like voting okay. or anything like so that. So when we get to 37, just note that. Okay. I'll call her. And then Sarah asked that this presentation get put to the end. Yeah. It's about 20, 30 it, minutes. Well, I'm, Everybody's okay with that. 10, 15 is what I told her to keep it to. So. Oh, okay. That's great. Okay. okay so yeah, we're, just like gonna, we're just going to pull this in. Yeah. And I'm sorry. Who's going to talk? Kelly? Oh, yeah. Kelly. Oh, Brennan. Okay. Yep. I know. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everybody. We have our council uh, working session. Today is March 31st. Looks like everybody's here. Um, everybody should have a copy of the agenda. Um, item number one uh, has been asked to be moved to the end of the agenda, and everybody is in agreement up here. So um, we're just going to start with number two, public works. Mr. Tech, you have the floor. And if you want to do two and then 15 through 35, Five, yes. feel free. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, I've got a very brief presentation. Um, item two in front of you today is an appeal by Jesse Herrera um, of an exception request denial to allow a second residential driveway approach on a collector street. Begin with the location map. Um, this is located out in um, Rapid Valley area off of uh, uh, looks like uh, Homestead and Buddy Court. The property that is outlined there is Mr. Herrera's property. He is requesting a second access to the north onto Homestead Street. Uh, as you all are aware, there was a recent TIF that was approved for the construction of Homestead Street to make it a, a through street. Um, from the Elkvale Road area uh, to where uh, it terminates here. Uh, our criteria manual is very specific about uh, second accesses for residential properties that they're prohibited on uh, collector and arterial streets. Certainly if this was a local street, uh, more than likely uh, city staff would have approved the exception. Uh, we did some traffic counts upon Missoula, which would be, or upon Bernice, which is uh, north here. So that's the circuitous route that the traffic has to uh, take really to access this area. Uh, if all of you that have been out there, you know you've got to kind of drive around to get to this point. Uh, we counted 3,700 vehicles uh, in a 24 hour period, and that was this week. So that was without any school traffic. So we anticipate there will be a high volume, uh, especially at peak times, so your morning peak and your afternoon peak, uh, coinciding with school on Homestead Street, and that is uh, primary justification that uh, staff is recommending uh, that the City Council deny this as well. Uh, I will stand for any questions on this item. I don't know if you want to call Mr. Herrera to the podium and ask him any particular questions or uh, anything of me. Go ahead, Mr. Larkenbach. Thank you, Madam Chair. And they, he, if you see where the Homestead Street is coming, where the, where the, where that's going to come through there, that's where he's requesting the curb cut. And that whole corner lot that's outlined in orange is his lot, his front lot. It, it wasn't available really to put the, uh, uh, garage access in there. The garage has been approved, so he can put the garage in the backyard. That white spot right there, that's all empty. The garage will be farther to the... Mr. Wife, the, Mr. Whitebuck, yeah. I can pull up a, a, 
This works for me. I'm fine with it. I mean, there's one that actually shows. Okay, shows perfect. That, okay. So Thank you. Back up here just a moment. Ah, oh, perfect. There you go. You can see where the garage is going to go on the back there. The curb cut will be from Homestead Street, like they said. If you in the front, he's got a in his driveway that can't get around the house. There, there's a, a fire hydrant in the front driveway, which hardly allows you to get back to that. Because originally they asked him to go through the side of the yard there, which I've been out there, visited the site. Um, yeah, there's. Uh, if you go farther east, there's a school. There's big apartment complex. There's houses with curb cuts on Homestead. So uh, I didn't see it, you know, as any issue going into the future for anybody. It's, it's a secondary access. There's a fence across the, his lot right there, so the curb cut would come in just to allow secondary storage in his uh, garage in the back. I don't see a problem approving it. It is a technicality. I get that. I spent some time with the planning department, and uh, because of the specific, you know, it was on, a, it was on the for borderline on the fence on whether they could do it or not, and, and I suggested at that time, or they suggested to bring it to the council for a, uh, to an appeal to look at it, but they have approved the garage. That so, uh, the, the clarification, they're waiting on a conditional use permit. It has not been approved yet, is my understanding. They're waiting on the uh, status of this access for okay. that. Okay, so we're actually just waiting on the access. And so, but that's, and Jesse is here if anybody has any questions for him. Um, I'm assuming, or in my conversations with him, he's going to put the fence back up. It'll just be a gate there. So it'll be a secondary place for him to use as storage. So he is in a unique situation because he is in that cul de sac where there's uh, limited frontage. But so. So there's I'll, no garage there now, correct? No, there, will, there is a garage on the front part of the house, but there's no garage in the back. So. But I'm open to questions. I did visit it, and then, I mean, we got till Monday. If anybody wants to visit it, Jesse will more than happy to show you around, show you where it's at, what it is. So. Okay. Ms. Drew, did you have a comment or a question? I do have a question, and I, I don't know if it's for Dale or Jesse, but um, uh, Mr. Tech, is he, is the homeowner putting any money into this project? Is it just city, city road? They won't to the street project? Yeah. No, that's entirely TIF funded, so no, the property owner would not be. He'll do his own curbside. Okay. But we really don't have that much traffic on that road to, to try and justify this, or will it, will it pick up? Well, yeah, there's, there's going to be an immediate, once that road opens, there's going to be at least 4,000 cars a day uh, using that road. Okay, thank you. I yield. Great. Mr. Stroman, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Dale, can you put that first slide back up? Certainly. <clears throat> so, Homes, is this going to be developed? I mean, is this, this is what's going to be extended out at Homestead Street? Correct. That will be extended to the uh, west and tied, tied into where Homestead currently ends to the west. Okay, and what about that road that runs to the south on that proposed extension? Like, uh, I think that will tie in. Um, it, it's, not, it's not here. It's, it's over here somewhere. It will tie into additional development going to the south. So right now it's a dead end, but it will be extended. Well. It will be a through street, correct. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Evans? Yeah, um, Mr. Tech, what other um, access off of Homestead is planned for the future in those? It is a three block or two block stretch? Three blocks? Um, because somewhere in the reading, and I'm trying to find it right now or right earlier, um, the, you know, talking about an arterial and the fact that there, we want to limit access on that. But the reality is for the last 25 years, we've had all those 4,000 cars, but turning at that corner, going another three blocks, turning at the next corner, going another three blocks, turning at the next corner, going another three blocks, coming back down to the south, turning. So those are the same cars. And there's, you know, lined with 
driveways and everything right now in the current thing. And if it hadn't been for us pushing for this to get this extension through for the last year and a half, maybe that wouldn't be happening. So is the plan really to not allow any access along that? Because ideally, that would be awesome. No, there, once again, I need to clarify, this is a secondary access that we're talking about today. Um, the address for this, this property is, is Buddy Court, and they have a driveway, have a primary access to the front of their home. They're requesting a secondary access. As you can see over here, there are no direct accesses ex with the exception of a street. I, I understand that. I get it. Um, so would there, that man, if you were, and I see he's trying to utilize his lot, um, would there be any uh, code violations or something if he were to run an access to that garage up along the side of his house? Would that also be denied? Is there even space to do don't, that? I don't there? think it physically would work. I don't think there's yeah. enough room to do that. So I see he's just trying to make the best of an awkward lot. So that was my question. But as far as you know, there will be other accesses along that street in the future. There are primary and we anticipate it probably will be more uh, office commercial, perhaps in nature. So there may be limited access, but most certainly there will be accesses, primary accesses to um, either businesses or per perhaps even homes. Okay, that's all I needed, thanks. Is Mr. Herrera here? Does he want to speak? Mr. Herrera? Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I guess the main, like, I just need more storage. I got four kids. Well, there's seven of us in the house total. And living in the cul-de-sac, I can't park anything. So it's hard for us to get my daughter's car out. We we move stuff so much. My wife will load up the twins. Oh, that's that's fun. I'll tell you that. Um, so I just need that access so I can get in and out. I mean, to park stuff so it's not being. I got a van. I got a couple other vehicles. So if we go on a trip, I can, you know, throw the kids in there so we can all go for once, not taking two vehicles or three vehicles. So if I could park something back there, that'd be great. So then we could just take one vehicle. We don't have to move five vehicles to get out of our house. It's, it's, a, it's an ordeal. So that's why I'm really trying to just get an access. It's limited use. It's not going to be used, really. Um, pretty much where I'm coming from, down by the school, there's a whole bunch of houses with access. They're all approaches on that road. It's the same road. Don't matter. It's the same through traffic. It's going to be the same regardless. So, I mean, I guess that's all I got to really say. So to clarify, is you don't plan on using this on a daily basis. It's just as needed as a It's secondary. as needed. That's what it's for. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that for the group. Mr. Nordstrom, go ahead. Thank you. Mr. Herrera, uh, I took a walk about yesterday afternoon. And I was uh, noticing in your backyard, there's a long trailer. Is that going to be used for that's this? That's my storage right now. <laughs> oh, that's your storage? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then will that be vehicle or trailer be used for uh, getting access to, the, or is that trailer going to go away? That trailer is going away. Okay. If I can get approved and get something built, well, cost lets me, um, that trailer is gone. That's just an eyesore. I don't want it there. I'm trying to keep my property. I mean, if you've seen it, that we, we keep it up pretty nice. I want to make yep. sure it stays nice, yep. you know. So, yes, that trailer will be gone. And that white pickup, that'll be gone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, um, just to be full disclosure, I'm very concerned about the uh, safety aspect of it. Even if kids are, are your Teenage, uh, teenagers if within your family uh, be, uh, getting access to that secondary access. So that's my main concern is that because of the traffic volume going through there. And, uh, and so that's why we know. have that 20-foot uh, approach plus another boulevard. That's another 20-foot. So there's 40-foot yeah. of almost 50-foot of room there. So there's sure be... You can see everything before you back out, pull out, whatever you're going to do. Yep, yep. That's you understand. I understand. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Yeah, I just ahead. want to add one more thing. I, and some of the communities that I travel to quite often, 
Um, I know that in their zoning laws, they would never allow this because they, on these semi-arterials that are main feeder streets, the collectors, they do not allow any driveway access. And that really allows for some great transportation advantages during rush hours and stuff. So I know where Mr. Tech and those guys are coming from a little bit, but the reality is that I don't know if those criteria are anywhere met there because I have a feeling there's going to be a lot more driveway access in those next upcoming three blocks. So just wanted to add that. Thanks. Okay. Seeing no questions or comments, I guess. Oh, Mr. Roberts, sorry. I guess I need to hold my hand up. I can't <laughs> put it in the queue. Uh, Mr. Herrera, I guess one of the things that I wanted to uh, ask again is the amount of uh, egress you're going to have into that shop. To me, it sounds like you're not going to be using it probably on a daily basis. No, the, it, the main house garage, that's what's going to be used. I mean, that's what it's for. That back there is just, just kind of secondary. Pro overflow and Pretty to get much. some of your vehicles and you some of your... have no idea how many toys I got. The garage is totally full. You can't park two cars in there. Uh -huh. You know, it, 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 we just need room. And I see that and I see that all the time. And being a secondary access without very much or with limited traffic going in and out of it, I don't have an issue with this whatsoever. I think that, uh, you know, when we can look at better land uses for the people in Rapid City and better ways to use their properties. I think it's a great idea. And again, if you go to the east on there and you get down on that street, there's a lot of accesses to the east of there off of onto that road. Um, and again, you know, when you go up to the north and you look at how many years we've had all that traffic going through there, and I don't think we've ever had an issue with any of those people backing out of those driveways. Uh, I don't personally have an issue with this. I think it's a good use of what he wants to do on his property. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Drew, go ahead. Uh, so I understand Richie with his safety issues and I, you know, and I just, I'd like to direct this question to John Roberts because he knows the area better than I do. Do you think we're setting ourselves up for uh, a lot more of these types of um, incursions onto that arterial road in the future? I don't think so because if you really take a good look at the GSI map for this area out there, this is really a unique property because of the fact that it's in a cul-de-sac right now so it can get a secondary access. Most lots out there, I would say 99.99% of them, don't have the ability to get a second access like this. So I don't think that we're really setting ourselves up for anything. So. But you said there, were, there was a lot more of those farther east. Um, so. But that's our primary access, not the secondary access. Okay. They couldn't even get a secondary access because those houses back up to another lot behind them. It's very kind of unique because of the fact that there's a cul-de-sac that hit the back of his yard backs up to a street. Typically when you're doing your planning, if you look up above there at the lots that are up above, you'll see that they've got a, a main access coming out on the road there and then they abut to a lot behind them uh -huh. so they couldn't get a secondary access. Okay, okay. All right, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I yield. I will think about more this more for Monday night. Um, that's when you'll actually get an answer. We're just discussing at this point. So thank you. Okay. All right. Anything else? <coughs> okay. Mr. I thank you, Mr. It. Herrera. Thank you. And feel free to come back on Monday evening during the council meeting. Okay. Okay. Mr. Tech, do you want to continue with items 15 through 35? Yes, I sure thank will. You. I don't have any. Lights up, please. I don't obviously have any other presentation items. Um, items 15 through 35, is there any specific ones the uh, members of the council would like me to address? Any questions? It looks pretty standard. Uh, Mr. Jones? Thank you very much. One in general, I, uh, there's some hot mix reference on here. When will the hot mix 
machine fire up for the spring and summer of when will we be able to start doing the hot mix projects? That typically occurs in April. Um, there are paving standards that both the state of South Dakota and, and City of Rapid City have for weather. Um, certainly when you're placing hot mix asphalt, there's temperature concerns and it was what, 15 degrees this morning in some parts of town, obviously too cold to be paving. So that seasonal limitation typically ends in April, but we're purchasing hot mix asphalt to be able to put in our pothole patchers. So uh, we're at the mercy of when the asphalt plants open up and typically that's in uh, mid-April. It, it may be earlier this year because we've had warmer than average uh, weather. Thank you. Anyone following along, this is number 18. Any other items that need to be pulled under public works? Mr. Evans? I just want to make a comment. You know, my dad was a highway contractor forever, and I grew up around all this stuff. I was a batch plant boy. But, you know, as I drive around the streets this, this spring, um, there's so many problems with chuck holes and cracks and everything, and I keep on wishing we could enter into some kind of a research project with tech to come up with a polymer based product or something in lieu of patching them with asphalt or even concrete that we came around and we sprayed in, we hit it with an ultraviolet right, it hardened. I don't know, we've got this research university out here. I think that would be a great project to experiment with them in and figure out something that we can quickly patch these things in a way that costs us not more than doing it the, the way that falls out in a year. Because when you patch concrete with asphalt, it's got a one-year lifespan. I mean, that's pretty much it. The coefficients of expansion are just too great. Everything is different. And so in lieu of going around cutting everything out and putting in concrete, which is a really expensive, I wish we could maybe talk to the people out here in our engineering departments at Tech and get a little research going. Thank you. Mr. Tech. I appreciate what Mr. Evans says. This is not a rapid city, but this is a worldwide problem. <laughs> and, and to think that there aren't people that would make a gazillion dollars off of something like this, trust me, there are people all over the world trying to find solutions. Uh, unfortunately, what we have today is, is the national standard. There aren't, there aren't the magic pills. There aren't the dental fixes that we could put in a hole and make it last for a lifetime, unfortunately. So. Uh, I agree. I'd, I'd be anxious to have some sort of other material that we could use uh, that is cost effective to help fill our potholes. Right. And, and Mr. Tech, you and I visited over that same issue, I think, three years ago, and you said there are some concerns about using experimental things. Well, I'm all about collaboration. Um, sometimes there's the downside to experiments, and we don't want to put our taxpayers or uh, tourists in jeopardy. But I agree. Uh, anything else under Public Works 15 through 35? If not, we'll move right along. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Tech. Um, moving on to our City Attorney's Office, Mr. Nyberg. Three and four. Work the microphone here. Uh, number three is uh, just a request by One Heart to uh, demolish a building on the campus. The request is linked to the agenda item, and uh, One Heart's executive director is here to answer questions if you have any. Okay. Ms. Doyle, thank you for being here. Anything you want to add, or just wait? You'll stand by for questions. Okay. Oh, sure. Our, Ms. Drew, go there ahead. we go. Um, where's Charity? Could Where's she you? come up for a sec? First of all, I love hearing from you and, and your project. So um, what's the, uh, the rationale behind the demolition? This is a building we weren't really sure what to do with. It has been used for storage for a number of years, even with the previous owner. Um, back way, way in the day, decades ago, this was the 24-7 building that the county had. Um, that program has moved elsewhere. Um, right now, this building, we've kind of looked at it to see if we could expand office space. It needs so much work that it would be better just to start over. And we're not ready and prepared to build a new structure, so right now we just want to get rid of the mold, and it's, it's, it's in pretty bad shape. So I think it's time to put it to rest. 
So you guys uh, aren't thinking of any kind of a storage um, facility for this because of mold? Is that what you're saying? Well, we've used it for storage for since, since we've acquired the property, uh -huh. um, but right now there's just no use for it. What we're finding, Darla, is that the, the building, um, because it's not occupied, our cameras don't hit the opposite side of it. So the south end of it where our other parking lot is gonna be refurbished just in the coming weeks. And so we have issues with sight lines and security on the other side of that building where we're finding people storing um, paraphernalia that they don't want oh. to take into the care campus next door, just folks in oh. the neighborhood <laughs> that are kind of passing through and finding hiding spots. Mm -hmm. um, so we just feel that with the type of environment that we're creating for One Heart Program participants, we don't, we don't want that. It's an eyesore. And like I said, even with future plans, if we wanted to rehab that building, it's going to be more than we bargained for. It'll be extremely expensive and just not worth it for the, the value of the structure today. So is the city absorbing any of the demolition costs? No, 100% on one heart. Okay, thank you. Yep. I yield. Mr. Jones. Thank you very much, Chair. If I may, uh, so what will that lot be used for then once that's torn down? Parking. Just it's a parking lot now. That's what okay. it's being used for. So <clears throat> this would just take maybe about another, expand that parking by about 25%. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Nordstrom. Thank you, um, Madam President. Uh, the uh, useful life of this building is gone. It it's, it's needs to be retired. So it, I'm going to be supporting this uh, demolition because it's way beyond. And uh, Ms. Doyle has got it, it exactly correct that it is uh, going to be way more expensive to refurbish this. So I can support it. Great. Mr. Evans. I just wanted to say, um, Charity knows that we were down there for that tour in October with the bishop. He was very appreciative of seeing all the facilities in that care campus. And I think when your project is totally finished, and it's nearing that, if not done, we need as a council to make sure everybody goes down and experiences that fabulous facility because this is something to really be proud of in Rapid City. And I don't think people are aware that we really do have a place for every head to lay at night if they choose to to use it i believe and so what you guys are doing is amazing so at when they are completed if you'd invite us i think we could get everybody down there to experience it would be my again. pleasure too thanks okay. anyone else great thank you okay mr nyberg number four number four is uh, authorization for the mayor and finance director to sign uh, series of agreements uh, that deal with sponsorships at the uh, post 22's Fitzgerald Stadium. Um, they're, I think, coming close to, to uh, putting the finishing touches on, and so this is sort of to, to move into that inaugural season. Will it be ready by Monday? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. <laughs> Probably not Monday. Okay. Um, there are three different uh, agreements that are linked, uh, Black Hill Surgical Hospital, um, Orthopedic Spine Center, and Midco, and so they're for three different sponsorships. Um, this went through the Parks and Rec Board, um, and it's the naming policy, the city's naming policy is attached as well. It's linked with the agenda item, so um, this is sort of the process to, to come and get final council approvals. So, uh, And we do have, um, someone from the Black Hill Sports and from the uh, surgical hospital here. Also, if you have questions. Somebody had a question? Mr. Solomon. Thank you, and it's more of a statement than a question. Uh, something I just wanted to share some appreciation on. Uh, I'm in favor of these naming rights because it really helps to offset some of the ongoing operational expenses as, as we've seen. What I appreciate about this is the renaming of, uh, of Fitzgerald still, honor, still will honor uh, the history of Floyd Fitzgerald. And I think it's important whenever we look to the future, which we all, all get very excited about, that we honor our past and our legacy and our history. And I love the idea that we struck a balance here between our history and our future. So uh, to Black Hill Sports, thank you. Um, I would also encourage, I see that uh, we don't quite have the lease agreements uh, the lease and the agreement synced up yet, but that we are going to work on that so that uh, they are not 
Uh, we don't have naming right agreements that don't sync up with the, our lease agreements for the actual facilities. So I, I would encourage that we continue to work towards that so that there's no confusion there. But, but just wanted to give a kudos for honoring our past while we look to the future. I think uh, striking that balance is very important for our community. So thank you. Appreciate it. I yield. Mr. Weissenbach. Thank you, Madam Chair. I toured the facility out there and my tour guide could have used a little help, but other than that, it was awesome. Uh, and this, this particular question came up about the signage, and, and, and uh, um, I've had some conversation with some of my fellow colleagues about naming, and, and, and they've, they've, they've really gone out of their way to, like Alderman Solomon has said, keeping Fitzgerald Stadium as Fitzgerald Stadium. They've also are honoring, I think, Dave Plouffe in this, in this deal, which was a long history of baseball in Rapid City. Rapid City's had a lot of success in baseball. The city's really gotten behind it. Um, the, the facility is, 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 is nice, very nice. I would recommend that anybody else get a chance to go out there and see that and then kind of see what the signage. One of the issues with the signage is they, they need to get it done. And it's part of their, it's part of their uh, funding mechanisms. Um, they're hoping that they're not going to have to come back to the table again and again like some of our other projects have happened. And I don't think that will happen with the one thing that I really want to say kudos to is the organization that's handling it. Uh, for the first time that I can recall, they're, they're trying to be all inclusive. They're looking at this as beyond a baseball stadium. They're looking at it as maybe having Mr. Evans come out there and bring his orchestra out there and put on a concert for us, uh, which he didn't. He just found out about that just now. But uh, <laughs> they're looking at really promoting baseball again. You know, uh, promoting the youth. They're going to. They're inviting 320, 22. It's come together over the years. They've really come together a lot. They're they're going after the younger. They're going after the younger crowds that are playing in the. Uh, Pony leagues and those types of things, the places that don't have any homes. They're reaching out to these guys, trying to bring them onto the field and say, hey, we want you to be part of this. We want you to be part of baseball. We want you to be part of the youth sports. But just, just looking at more than just a baseball field. Right. It's, it's the first time that I've ever actually you know, heard someone come forward with that without being forced to do it. So it's, it's, it's an awesome. Right. And, but this signage thing is important. He, he was entertaining other people to to try to get them to, to see the benefit of their signage and stuff like that. And one of the things that came up was time was of the essence, obviously. So I appreciate Madam Chair allowing the, the, the comments. The takeaway I took from our Parks and Recreation meeting a couple of weeks ago is we have a June 1st deadline for opening day of June 3rd, going off the top of my head. But we're looking at the first week of July, I'm sorry, the first week of June. So that is why it's important to get this signage taken care of. Is there anybody from the community that wants to speak on this? Okay, any, oh, Mr. Jones, go ahead. Thank you very much. Who's here with the organization? I can ask a question. Okay. Uh, I remember when this thing first started, there was concern about there wasn't going to be an umpire room. And as a retired umpire who never missed a call in my life, I just, <laughs> I just thought I'd take the opportunity to ask about the umpire room and who's sponsoring that. Me? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great question, and uh, thank you very much for your time today. Um, when we, we came in front of the council last summer, uh, last June, uh, to get this project underway, we had to do some value engineering. So there's some key components to the field that we, we had originally in the project, and when we bid it out to, to get it under the $5 million, we had to take a few things out, including other things that are necessary at the stadium, like the batting cages. So. Part of the process, and I know I've talked to some of the council that we've had a chance to do some tours with, is that um, because of that, we're trying to be self-sufficient. We're raising some money, some cash flow streams that we can uh, pay off our existing overage because we had to come up with $400,000 on our own to pay for the turf. And so when this is all done, we're going to kind of gather up again and try to add these, these back into the project. A couple of them are actually planning on starting next year, which is one of the key components to what uh, Councilman Weifenbach alluded to is the, and, and Councilman Solomon on the, the legacy of the state, and there's a rich history here, and, and our Hall of Fame plaza that we had to take out of there is approximately about 150, and we've already got half of it raised. 
and so we want to get that in there as well. So um, ultimately, we'd love to have it next year, but we're going to have to we're going to have to get some of these more sponsors lined up to have a cash flow stream to to bank that. The, the importance of an umpire room shouldn't be understated, especially when there's tournaments and all-day events because when you're out there working a ball game all day, you're hot, you need to cool off so you can go back and work the next game accurately and safely. Or if there's a heated thing, you need to be able to have a safe place for the officials to go. So I hope that stays a high priority because taking good care of the umpires, without umpires, you don't have ball games. So taking good care of the umpires is an essential part of this, and I, I appreciate the fact that it hasn't been pushed aside. Absolutely, I, I agree 100%. Mr. Evans. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment that when we had the tour um, a couple weeks ago, it really is going to be impressive and beautiful, make for some great summer evenings. My concern at the time is we still did not find money for you know, a state-of-the-art video board or anything. Um, it was pointed out to me uh, by several sources that, you know, these things come on the market and you watch these big football stadiums and everything, they, they get rid of, you know, they upgrade all the time. And I think we as a council have to sort of stay on the ready to pounce. If a bargain does come up that we can help really finish that off and make it state of the art facility, we'd all love it to be, that we'd be willing to be versatile and act quickly. If something does come up to repurpose, because you know, these big places like, you know, I go down to all the Nebraska games and my Husker baseball team is doing well this year, by the way. They don't stink for the first time in ages. And so, I mean, they spend millions of dollars upgrading these boards and many of them are perfectly good and I don't know why they couldn't be repurposed. And with Dactronics down the road 300 miles, I bet we could be creative and then really have the facility that would, you know, put the crowning touch on that. So let's stay versatile and maybe think about the ability to act quickly if something does come up. Just want to put that in, thanks. Great. Thanks. Mr. Stroman. Just to follow up on that, I do think, Tom, didn't they repurpose some seats from Rosenblatt Flat Stadium in uh, Omaha the last time that they fixed up? I mean, this organization is always looking for that opportunity, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. That in action, and you are correct. We did use the old Rosenblatt Stadium, and and if you remember, the last game of the season uh, was in the Veterans Classic, which was the first co-branded tournament with 320. We're we're trying to work together on that. Um, but a after that game ended, um, before midnight, almost all of those seats were removed. Um, a lot of them were sold to longtime fans. I have two of them in my garage right now as well to, to keep some of that past. So we have looked in the past to repurpose some things. Unfortunately, with this project, having to put new concrete down, we did have to order new seats. And of everything that came in on the project, honestly, that was the, that was the best that we received because in the middle of COVID, they weren't selling a lot of seats around the country with venues getting shut down. So we, we are going to get new, new seating our entirely, but not, they're not all going to be individual like the old Rosenblatt's. Anything else? Mr. Stroman? No. Okay, great. Ms. Drew? Okay. Um, so I heard you speak about your $400,000 turf, and that gives me some pause and concern. Um, if someone else wants to use this for a concert or something like we just talked about with Bill, I have seen that um, you know, groups like this have been proprietary on their use of the turf because they're afraid it'll get damaged by people walking on it. Is there any discussion about that in future, future uses? Um, there, we'll get a lot more into depth uh, once we, we get it delivered. One of the things that we haven't had a chance to dive entirely into is the warranty on it. Um, if you remember, the, one of our largest tournaments of the year is the firecracker, where mm -hmm. we do fireworks it. And, and they said, you can continue to have fireworks, but we're going to have to relocate those a little bit away from the, the turf so that we don't cause damage. So. Um, when we're talking about multi-purposing the, the facility, um, you know, we want to be obviously more inclusive. I, one of the examples I gave was last year would have been fantastic if this would have been up and running to actually have the two high school graduations. It, it would have been a way to spread everybody out. There's, there's just more opportunity on the bookends too for say some concerts and some things of that nature. It's just going to have, we're going to have to lay out a plan on how to make sure we don't um, damage the turf through, through warranty. But um, I know there's a way to do it because we've seen it in other places. Maybe you have to put plywood out, things like that. 
um, to on top of the turf if you're going to put a stage or something like that on top of it. So that makes me concerned that it's not actually multi-use at this point. I mean, you know, you're you're telling me you don't know. I I don't. I don't have the warranty um, in front of me. No, I, I guess we can dive into that. Okay. Again, well, when the city pays for things and we're told it'll be multi-use, I'd like to actually see that come to fruition. Um, do you have a budget for your operations for a year? I mean, do you know what they are? Do you have any kind of guess? Or yeah, the, just for generally speaking, for to operate this this facility for a year. Um, all of those are, are actually passed on to our subtenant, which is actually Baseball Parents, Inc. That's the baseball side of, of the operations because they're at the facility the majority of the, the time, or at least they have been in the past. So Black Hill Sports, our, our budget is primarily run off of the, the rentage of the, the signage in the outfield, which in the past has been about $45,000 a year the last, well, probably pretty consistently in that, that range for the last 10 years. Okay, but this is a whole new facility, so this is going to probably be a lot more expensive. So do your sponsors, right now, uh, from what I could tell of what you were saying, your sponsors don't cover your expenses? Um, actually, uh, right now as it stands, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cover our operation expenses, but, and then some to add more projects down the road, including the umpire room, the batting cages, how we have it budgeted to sell some of these sponsorships because um, we have some other smaller ones they're not uh, I guess part of the naming rights but like our our bullpens and things of this nature um, our goal is to is to raise through these sponsorships about 1.2 million and if if this was to pass inclusive of the, some of the smaller ones we already have, have I had contracts in place of about 700,000 okay in that range well I saw one of the naming rights was 25,000 for over 10 years. I mean, which adds up to be a real nice thing, but for $25,000 for a year, it, I don't know, I'm really thinking you're, you might be lowballing that, but it looks like that's kind of in place already. As a, I'm a fundraiser, so I know how those things go. It seems like we're kind of not, not um, maybe not charging enough. Um, and finally, um, how will you involve any uh, girls in, the, in some of the activities that are going on in this? facility yeah you know with the with the turf it's going to give more use days on it because you don't have to worry about the, the grass getting trampled down and, yeah and right now um, we have several girls softball teams uh, throughout the winter that actually uh, lease or or come in and utilize our indoor facility right now obviously with having no field to practice on if you go around we've had pretty good weather so post 320 and, and the high school teams in McKeague are out there but all of our people are kind of packed into the indoor facility right now, so we have to spread it out really on the weekends, almost sun up to sundown. There's usually somebody in the facility, so they do them in hour to two hour increments, and that is inclusive of several soft, girls softball teams. In the Fitzgerald Stadium, not in an indoor space? In, in, in the, right now in the, in the indoor space. Right? How about in the future? Yes, we can we can consider that as well. Um, the the only the only challenge is we just have to make sure we move the the base base paths to allow for right. you know mm -hmm. the right size, and that's what we're doing for some of the youth like the pony leagues to okay. come in. The only thing that you know that is if if they chose to use the the field that they'd have to be aware of is that the the mound is its place because it's under the turf is under it's concrete so it's not movable. So you know it would be behind whoever was the pitcher. Mm -hmm. So you, they just have to be aware of some of the, the safety standards. I'm sure those things could be remedied if we really needed one to, to use them. Um, because, you know, I see girls softball and those kinds of things as being a, a general uh, huge tournament income source for the city as well. So um, please be thinking outside the boy box, you know, and uh, try and get some females in there. I'd really appreciate that. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Evans? Hey, I just wanted to reassure Darla that that surface, um, I think it's field turf in this case, not aster turf, right? It's a really amazing, you know, multi layered thing. And I think the biggest concern when you do let in, a, it's not walking on it so much as it is 
you know, uh, platform legs and stuff, puncturing membranes and damaging it that way and everything. And I've been to a lot of graduations and these, you know, college graduations. And there's always these gigantic rostrums set up with 100 people on them. So it can be done if it's done properly. But I agree with you that we need to think, you know, you said outside the boy box. <laughs> we could really get a lot of good use out of the, that place and it could be a source of uh, great pride for more people if they would just see it because they're getting to use it from time to time. So I think it will be used as a multi-purpose facility. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you for being here. We'll obviously continue the discussion on Monday. All right. Thank you. Great. Um, number five under fire department, Chief Culberson. Thank you for being here given what's going on locally. Thank you. Thanks, Pauline, for texting me. <laughs> one is pretty simple it's a service agreement start our project with station one um, starting the architectural work we went through a process over the last two months on selecting I believe well, RJ's not here but I believe we started off with eight or nine and got down to Chamberlain who is going to be the recipient of that great so Thank you. Looking Mr. forward to the process. Mr. Solomon has some comments or questions. It's a it's a comment and a, and a question. Uh, don't have a problem with this, but I think it's appropriate while you're up here. How are you, how are you, your teams doing in terms of assisting with the wildfire? First of all, let me say this: we are extremely grateful um, for you and for all of the agencies who are working um, to fight this wildfire. We've obviously been paying very close attention. But I'd love to hear an update and a perspective from you on you and your team and, and how we're doing. Sure. Um, and thank you. Uh, yeah, on Monday when the, the wildland fire started off in uh, Westbury Trails, off the Westbury Trails up by Blue Sky, um, we were initially just in an automatic aid, so we sent out our first do engine out that way, wildland engine, but quickly saw that it was moving our way and we activated a uh, all call. So we ended up at that time on Monday, we had 36 um, people on the fire. That didn't include folks like me, a couple of our division chiefs that were out there. Um, but what we also had was every single apparatus in town still covered. So we were ready for the next incident if it did happen. So we basically had two full shifts working on Monday. Um, guys got tired, they worked for 24 hours. Um, a couple of, a few of them did. Um, Tuesday came and we were down to about 21 people on the, the fire at that time. And then we started working into the shifts at that point. So um, at this point, we only have a couple of apparatus on the fire. Um, but we have about a half a dozen people at a minimum, or 10 people out on the fire today. Guys are doing good. Um, thanks to the community um, donating water, Gatorade, we appreciate it. But there's plenty at this point, and please direct your um, donations towards the volunteer services around our departments. Um, a Type 2 team took over last night. With the Type 2 team comes a lot of stuff, including water, Gatorade, food, hoses, you name it. Um, they bring a lot to the table. Fire's going good. Um, unfortunately, you know, the way this works, the state has the fire. It's actually a federal fire at this point and they kind of released the information. Um, but I think we've got a pretty decent handle. There's still a concern, obviously, uh, with this weekend as the temperatures rise and the winds are going to switch the other way that we could still have some, some issues. But thankfully, the community understood what we were trying to accomplish and what was gonna happen. Um, Thankfully, now they're starting to get back into their residences. I know the Pinedale Heights area has been opened up for um, those that live there. Um, also up along where the Minaluzahan camp is, um, those residents are starting to be able to get put back in. But driven the fire several times. There's a lot of damage. It's in the same place as the fire was in 1988. A lot of the same area. So um, I will want to shout out and give some kudos Many of our areas that were going to be impacted in the city, there was a lot of thinning that was done in that area, a lot of force management by um, not only um, through some um, grants that we provide, 
but also some private citizens did some firewise um, things and made sure, and I think that helped immensely with this fire to keep it down on the ground where it didn't crest up into the trees and start burning worse. So kudos to that. And I can't say enough about the agencies that cooperated throughout this fire, both federal, um, state, and all of our volunteer agencies, including and including our folks that stepped up and, and really made a good effort and fought a good fight. And we're lucky with the wind change in the middle of the morning <laughs> that it took a 90 degrees and stayed away from the city at that point. But I feel sad for the, the, the homeowners that lost pieces, including a home, but wish we could have done, had a different outcome that way. But it's the way wildland works. Yeah, well, I, uh... I echo everything you said about the appreciation. Um, I would encourage the public, if if, uh, if any of them are listening, when we have these situations uh, where we have roads blocked off, fire coming on, not to impede traffic and get in the way. I know it's natural whenever we see accidents or we see uh, major events to try to congregate and check it out. Uh, but I would say if you do so, stay out of the way. I, I think that I'm sure our law enforcement officers have been really big on trying to manage traffic. Uh, with that so that that you and, the, and folks like like you and other agencies can do their jobs we appreciate that and we'll continue uh to pray that the winds blow the right way yeah and, that, and i'll give a shout out to to don's folks and and they they pd jumped right in made a telephone call to us um and just asked what they could do and we're ready to roll and did everything they possibly could gave great amount of help uh, Pennington County Sheriff's the same way so absolutely thank you uh, Chief Hedrick to you and your team as well and our our parks and rec we have urban forestry there are a lot of things that we do in town this is a team effort I think I can speak I can't always speak on behalf of the council but I think all of our council members strongly support um, those of you who are serving on the front lines if there's anything that we can be of assistance with um, please let us know but please know you have our appreciation and uh, thank you for the update Thanks. Oh, and thank and I got to shout out to Dale too. He mm -hmm. he gave me a call, and made sure we, he knew where they were ready for us too. So, yeah, kudos to you too. Thank you. Great. Thank you for the update. We have two council members that have some comments or questions. Mr. Weissenbach, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I I want to personally thank the fire department. I have a, a partnership with some acreage that's on the north part of town. And that same night, we had a fire right next to us, and the fire department was there and had that fire put out within. 10 minutes. I also want to appreciate the fact that the councils in the past have set up with the fire department, the county emergency department I had mentioned before, uh, fire mitigation things. And this, he had mentioned, uh, Chief mentioned uh, how that plays a role in, in what, how extensive those fires get. When we bought, when I bought that land with my partner, we, it was about a $60,000 bill to, to mitigate that. And there was some grant money available. We worked with Mr. Weaver. Yep, Lieutenant and Weaver. We're still in the process of mitigating it, but we found out what the fruits of that, you know, basically you reap what you sow. I would tell people in the community to keep up the good work, listen to these people when they come to you about fire mitigation, about removing your trees. Uh, it may not be in the beautifulest aspect of what you think, but I can tell you what, it can save your structure, save your life, save your neighbor's lives. Uh, again, I'll just echo the sentiments of Mr. Solomon, and I, let him, I have a personal thank you because th they saved what could have been a complete disaster if, if they hadn't been there in, that quick and put that fire out within, I mean, it wasn't, I bet it wasn't even 10 minutes maybe, yeah. but they, they were on that fire and they put it out. It could have been the same type of destruction, which would have probably been worse because it would have came down into the, into the subdivision in North Rapid and, and it would have been terrible, but they were there, they put it out. And uh, then I had a question on, on, on number one. Number one, is that the main firehouse? Yes, that's okay. the main station, 10 Main Street, Which, right downtown. I'm disappointed to see this because when I was on the council before, we had a plan to redo this fire station. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to support this because that's what we got to work with now. I would have rather have seen the restructure go forward. I also would obviously see the restructure you know, the police department's quarters over the years, I mean, sometimes it was like a dungeon before. I think they've done some upgrades on it. But these guys are working in conditions 
just blow my mind. And that, that, that was set, we were set to have that land across the street from the fire department set up to build a new building. We could have maybe even had a joint effort with the police department and got these guys in some really good working conditions. I mean, they're out on the street beating the streets. Their lives are in jeopardy all the time. And this is one thing that we can do as a council. It's the one thing we should do as a council to make sure that those, th those two things are provided for before anything else. And I, I'm gonna support this because it's what we have to work with now. It's unfortunate because that land was slated to build a new building and, and get some of this, you know, we have state-of-the-art equipment in any of you toured it, I'm sure they're making it work down there, just like the police department makes theirs work, but and hindsight's 2020, I guess, but there was some foresight put into that, so however that got changed around along the road, just understand when we make the decisions up here, like these types of decisions, these are the things that happen. When we, when we started that, wire, that wildland mitigation, there was a lot of pushback from a lot of people in the community that lived in the trees, but I'll guarantee you they're not pushing back today. Uh -huh. So, and I appreciate your guys' efforts, and I just wanted to set that forward. So. Okay. Mr. Nord Nordstrom. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Chief Culverson, is it still Lieutenant Weaver that's still doing the uh, well, uh, forest mitigation or whatever? That, yep, that? yep, Lieutenant <laughs> Weaver heads that up for our, either, he's in our prevention division and our fire and life safety division yes. under Tim Billings. Under Tim uh, Appreciation to him and the rest of the crews that were involved with this fire. I, I can't say enough for the kudos for everything that you folks are doing. and. I'm also on board with this supporting the fire station one, and uh, um, I guess I'll stay away from the politics of what happened behind the scenes of why why they, we have to go with the route we're doing. So um, there's some other circumstances that are involved in that. But you know, anyway, uh, I'd also want to thank the folks for that or sending out the 211 updates on the fire because it was very helpful to get that word out to the public. Um, I can't say enough that uh, I know I was getting most of mine from Daryl Shoemaker. So uh, if they're originating in your station or where they're coming from, I, I just want to say thank you for all those people that are involved in that emergency management. If it's, when it's appropriate, Chief Culverson, uh, uh, I'd like to have a, a, some, somewhere along the line to have a discussion on a fire station over on the east side of Rapid City. Uh, we're uh, near East Middle School in that area, someplace over there, because I think the closest station we have right now is either the one up on um, the north side of town. I forget that is it Station Six? Or, no, that's the, the Station Seven. Station Tish Seven, yes. Yeah. And, and the other closest one we have is Station One. So to get out to uh, East Middle School in that area. So it, when it's appropriate, I'd like to have that discussion. Love to have that discussion because that's starting to turn into one of the uh, uh, prime places to put our next station. And, and, we're, and we can get into that a little more. I'd love to have yep. that conversation. That would be great. And, and, uh, and I appreciate everything that you're doing. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Jones. Thank you. At the risk of sounding like an old poop, I'd just like to have the typo fixed before this goes to. I noticed that too. Is, just is it the Rapid City Dire Need Station or Rapid City <laughs> Fire Station? We can go either way. I just think we should get it right. We'll get it changed. I kind of like Dire Need. <laughs> we'll let Mr. Weifenbach build you a bigger building. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Any more discussion on number five? Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to your department as well. Okay. Moving right along, number six under our police, I'm sorry, six and seven under our police department, Chief Hedrick. Thank you. Nope. Yep. Okay, how about now? Tef. Yep. All right, thank you. A uh, couple somewhat um, standard type of items. Uh, number six is uh, we have a pretty good working relationship with Western Dakota Tech. Obviously, we have. Uh, work together closely with them in regards to recruiting and such. And the holsters that we're talking about here are not usable by our staff anymore. They're old and they have a need for them for training purposes. So the thought would be to surplus and 
allow them to use them for training if approved. Uh, the next item is um, our FOCA grant. We've applied for this for several years in a row now, and uh, there, it's a no match type of grant that we'd be able to utilize the funds to help support our quality of life unit and our uh, the youth outreach that we're doing. So a um, couple good proactive type programs that we have, and this would be a way to uh, fund that further. And um, very similar to the request that we put in last year as well, so. Mr. Jones. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanna make sure, since I took a whooping in, in this chair one time for wanting to surplus some land without following proper procedure, do we have to surplus these and follow that before we could donate them to Western Dakota Tech? Or are we able to just directly donate them? I just want to make sure we follow the right path. I love the idea. I support yeah. it 100%. Yeah, I'll I let, just want to make sure. I'm not necessarily the expert in that, but Pauline could probably help us out. I do believe we've filled out the paperwork to surplus it as well. Yes, before the city gets rid of any uh, property, it must be surplus first, no matter what the what we're doing with that property. So that has to be advertised and all that. We've, we've recently done that with some various things. So will we be acting on the surplus Monday night then? Um, it, it should have been attached today. I'm not sure why it's not, but yeah, it should have been on the, on the agenda as part of this okay, item. Right. But everything that needs to be done to make it a legal surplus has taken place. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, anything else? Chief Hedrick? Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving right along uh, under Parks and Recreation, number eight, Director Begor, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. This is a, uh, the approval of a, uh, an agreement with Black Hills Works for custodial service uh, in our parks restrooms. Uh, this is a one-year agreement with the ability for three additional one-year uh, terms uh, at the same terms and conditions as the original uh, agreement. Uh, this would uh, start uh, May 1st this year. Uh, this service would be from May through September, uh, seven days a week in our, in our restrooms. Mr. Jones? Thank you very much. Yay! This is cool because I remember someone standing at that microphone and stuff when we were talking about your contracts and letting all of that out. Someone in the room said, well, can Black Hills Works? Why can't they get in on it? And you made the comment appropriately so that they can apply and, and put in for it just like anyone else, which sounded like a great idea. And now it's exciting to hear that they've come forward and we have a contract in place with them. Yay, the process worked. That's awesome to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Mr. Weifenbach. Awesome. Thank you, Madam Chair. They, they've done this before. They have, yes. I'll... You, you said a one-year contract with... Correct. No, and there's an option for another year at a time for three years. Can you explain why that would be that way and not just give them a three-year contract? Well, that gives them the opportunity if, uh, if, if conditions arise that they need to increase uh, their bid uh, or for some other reason, you know, if COVID, a, if COVID hits okay. again and, and we don't have any of the restrooms open. It just uh, allows a little more flexibility for both parties. Do you remember why they they quit bidding the project before, or maybe they just didn't get the bid? Uh, no, uh, they they had the contract, uh, and then last year, th when we didn't open up the restrooms, they obviously did not have a contract. Okay. So we needed to right. then just start over from square one. Appreciate that. Okay, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Anything else, Director Beegler? No, thank you. Okay, moving right along. Uh, under Finance Department, Director Sumption, 9 through 14. 9 is standard for our volunteers to be covered under our workers' compensation insurance. Number 10, the balance at the end of February in our general fund was $32.7 million. I do want to point out, though, that we only received one sales tax payment in February, and so it's down about one and a half million dollars what it would normally be had we received both payments that month. We did receive three payments in March though to make up that difference. Uh, 11, um, Mr. Dudley had applied for owner occupied status and there was an error on the county side and did not get that taken care of. So this would allow for owner occupied status on a property that he owns. 
12, um, if you missed it in the paper, for January we're up 12.6% over January of last year. I caution people don't get too excited about it. It's a one month snapshot in time. The first payment in February is already less than the first payment in February last year. So um, it may even itself out over the two month combined percentage. 13, this is um, water rec item. It's a UTV and they want to surplus it for a trade in. And number 14, this is a life safety loan. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it puts sprinkler systems in buildings that don't have them. And um, very much uh, a good project for the fire department to take on. This is for, the, this should be RICE, R-I-C-E, 301 family properties. This is um, the RICE property at 301 Campbell. It used to be the RICE Honda. It's now, I believe, a fireplace thing and, and part of the building and then the other rest of the building is up for um, tenants yet. So that would be 80% of the project that they are completing. Having talked with Tim Billings, they are um, essentially done with the project and just waiting for this piece of it. And then if you go to the end of the agenda, there's second reading of two ordinances under the finance office and nothing has changed from the last time. Mr. Weifenbach. Madam Chair, uh, number 11, that this will give Mr. Dante or Mr. Dudley his uh, owner occupied status. That is so correct. The county agreed to that and whatever it would work process. That's awesome. Okay, perfect. Mr. Dante Dudley does live in my ward. He runs his own business. He's an outstanding citizen of the community. So that that's a good deal to see that they're going to honor that. So thank you. Any other questions, comments? Great. We're through uh, moving, we're through public works. So I guess we're gonna jump to community development number 36. So Madam Chair, items 36 through 43, in addition item 47, you see that one on non-consent because we got it to you late. Um, Kelly Brennan is here from our future land use planning division. I would like to give you just a brief summation on item 37. And then Michelle Schulke is here if you had, uh, have any questions on the CDBG items. Great, thank you. Welcome, Ms. Brennan. Thanks for being here. This is number 37, correct? Correct. All right. Uh, good afternoon. So this is the contract for the transit development plan. We've been talking about this for about a year and a half, and there's been some delays, some postponements. We're really excited to get started. So this is just the standard contract that you guys would see with any of our projects. Um, and the reason I'm actually here today would be to um, hope that one of you would like to join our study advisory team. Um, we'd really like to have city council impact on from the very beginning through the whole process of that study as you all know it's really important um, our community is growing like crazy we've grown by over 8,000 people just in the last 10 years we're continuing to grow so i don't know if you want to discuss it and then get a hold of me or uh, email me but we would love to have representation it would be about six meetings some reviewing of documents um, and be, you'd be part of the plan from kickoff date till the final recommendations so well, feel free to, she's saying just email her directly, so I'll just let you do that, okay? Um, I had some hands up. I didn't know if that was directed yeah. to her or oh, yeah. Mr. Jones, did you have something to add? Well, part of my committee assignment is the Mayor's Committee for People with Disabilities, and they have a very, very strong interest in the transit program and the expansion of it, et cetera. So I, I would very much like to be involved in this because of my role on that and just the general strong interest in it. And, and Ms. Hansel had informed me to put you guys, or to put that committee on our in interested parties list that we've started to have make sure that they were involved in any of the public participation events that we would have and as a stakeholder um, to be involved in that process. So that is already on our list of people to, to consider for the project. Great. So should I email you then if I want to be involved or? Yep. Chairman? Yep, I'll be the pro uh, project director on this on okay. this particular study, mm -hmm. and so um, you have to just email me directly, and we can get you on the list. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I just want to make a comment. You know, we get a little feedback. If you look at her mic display right at that speaker. It makes it hard for people running the media. So if you guys could always direct the microphone towards your face, 
I don't know. <laughs> Mr. Nordstrom. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Ms. Brennan, thank you very much for bringing this forward. I, I've been looking for this for about a year and a half, maybe two years. Uh, so uh, I totally understand all the delays and everything that's on that. So all of these requests that I've been getting to be involved in this transportation study, would you like that information emailed to you or should we go through a liaison or please guide me? If you have any interested parties that would like to be part of the public participation process or a stakeholder, um, we're looking at like large employers as being stakeholders. The school district is definitely a stakeholder. Yep. If you can think of any of those groups or have interested parties, by all means, please email me that information. I will. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Weissenbach. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, <clears throat> the transit department I mentioned last time, I. I love, I love how you guys operate and what you do and the service you provide is just detrimental to a lot of people. I mean, it, not detrimental, it's, a, it's an asset to a lot of people in our community. So I'm hoping that we could maybe get Mr. Schumacher involved in some, uh, some public service announcements that we can share as council members to people um, in our areas and stuff. He, he did it for Mr. Jones and I on a, um, uh, just making people aware of speeding and we did get somebody to finally go 70 miles an hour and, and wreck their car so I guess they're effective but I mean if because there'll be people there'll be a lot of people in the community wanting to know how the routes are changing if the routes are going to change types of things like that because it could affect how they're doing and their input into it they may see something that we don't see so and Mr. Schumacher can if he could put something together Madam Chair as we think about this and go forward and any of us could share our, our input with her so I appreciate you, Mr. Jones, volunteering for that. Daryl does a press release on all of our public meetings that come from the Long Range Planning Department. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Brennan. Thank you. Um, anything else? 38 through 43. So only if you've got questions on any of these items. Otherwise, these are this is pretty this standard standard information that you would see. Okay, I see Michelle Schulte waiting for us. Thank you, Madam President. Only if anyone has any question, I'd, I'd be happy to address. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, moving right along. Thank you, uh, Finance Department. Did we already do these? She yep, that's right. And I didn't check. There, now I checked. Okay, airport. Tony Broom, thank you for being here. Okay. Further questions from the last meeting? As far as I know, there's been no changes to it. Okay. okay. Seeing none. All right. Um, and now uh, we're, we're going to go back to number one, which was put at the end of this. Sarah Hansel. She has a presentation on the strategic housing plan draft. Good afternoon. The last item on the agenda today is the initial presentation and discussion of the draft strategic housing plan. This is a planning document that builds on many, many years of past community work, including the city's own comprehensive plan, the affordable housing resolution that the city council adopted in 2019, and also many years of past grassroots um, community work, including that of collective impact. So the goal of this plan is to identify strategies for the city, uh, policies or programs that we can take on in order to create and preserve housing that serves a broad um, array of, of community needs. So affordability is at the crux of this plan, but we're talking about affordability for many, and we'll go into more detail on that topic. So my objective today is to um, give you a brief presentation of this plan and then leave plenty of time um, at the end to, to hear from you. What are your feedback? What's your comments and suggestions? for how we make changes to the plan. And our ultimate goal then is to be able to bring back the final plan to the city council for approval, as well as um, specifically there are two ordinances that we've created in draft form that we'd like to bring back in the near term as sort of the quickest wins for actions that the city can take. 
to in improve housing opportunities in the community. So when we talk about housing, one of the first questions that comes up, and rightly so, is that of terminology. Uh, we're talking about affordable housing, what does that mean? You hear many buzzwords associated with the topic of housing, rightly so, affordable, work for, workforce, attainable, market housing, we talk about subsidized housing, we talk about housing that is accessible to a good number of people. And in naming this document, we uh, landed on the word strategic housing because really what we're trying to do is en encapsulate the needs that are really reflected in all of these terms. But definitions matter and uh, so affordable, what's one definition? One that's commonly used and what we rely on this plan is a definition from housing and urban development. It's around this idea of housing cost burden and that is when a family or household pays more than 30% of their income on housing and utilities and also have difficulty affording other necessities. So if you're a household with a, a great degree of wealth, you can afford to pay 30% or more of your income on housing and, and not have it sacrifice other basic needs such as education, groceries, medical bills, those sorts of things. So we're talking about affordability being 30% of income while still being able to um, pay for other needs that you have. So Rapid City is not alone in struggling with housing affordability issues and there's a reason for that because housing is a really you know, complex topic. There are a dozen, more, a dozen or more factors that really play into the cost to develop, maintain, operate housing and thusly the, the cost to purchase housing as well. So those are some of the factors you're familiar with them. And the topic really only becomes more complicated when you consider that all of these factors in and of themselves really influence each other and um, there ends up being this kind of ripple effect through the economy and through the housing market. So, you know, it's, it's complicated and there's no easy solutions to housing affordability. What this plan is hoping to do is really focus in on what, what can the city do? Where does the city have the most impact and the most opportunity to make the biggest difference? And it is a lot about collaboration, but it's also about the city being realistic about where do we have the most leverage? So there's three areas highlighted and we'll talk about this as being at the crux of the recommendations. It's about the regulatory environment, transportation and mobility, and uh, other funding tools and how we're making um, the most use of funding tools that are available. Uh, this next few slides is going to introduce a few key pieces of data about housing. There's certainly many more data points in the housing plan, so if you're interested in that, I um, suggest you take a closer look. And this data point is this topic of area median income, or AMI. If you're someone who looks at housing policy or housing issues, you're going to see AMI everywhere because it's oftentimes what's used to look at sort of the level of affordability. So in Rapid City, AMI is about $50,000 per household. Going back to that concept of housing cost burden, we estimate that up to 25% of households in our community are housing cost burden. So that's a substantial figure. And it's also worth noting that households who rent experience housing cost burden at a much greater degree. So for example, 26% of households with a mortgage are expected to have housing cost burden and 47% of those who have mortgages experience housing cost burden. Okay, this graphic depicts many topics all surrounding housing and various conditions and ultimately tries to link these conditions to what our recommendations, what our recommendations in the plan are. Uh, but it can be a lot to look at at once, so I just want to break it into a few smaller pieces and, and look at it closer. At the bottom layer here, the first level, uh, you see representations of the entirety of our housing market based on income. And I did. Uh, have a handout put out if anyone is unable to read the text on the screen. There's a chart in front of you as well. Um, so this looks at our whole housing market from extremely low income through very high income. Again, based on the notion that there's a middle and that middle is $50,000 per household. So that's here. And that's suggesting, what that means is that half of households make more than $50,000 and half of households make less. And some of those terminology, um, You'll notice here homeless emergency housing, transitional housing, public housing. This is kind of the general area where some of those terms come into play. You'll also notice on this graphic some statistics for Rapid City specifically. So 13% of households are in this extremely low income category, 22% in very low, and then moving up. So if you're kind of interested where um, different groups are falling, then zoom in on that layer. Adding a little bit more information, this is referencing back to that topic of area median income. And if you're someone who thinks about housing in terms of, well, 
what's the monthly cost? Then that next level up looks at what a household within that category can afford to spend on their housing. Going up one level further, we see some of the providers and um, incentive or subsidy programs that are um, you know, widely acknowledged or widely recognized. What's important to understand about this section of this chart is that there are many unmet needs. These programs do great work, but they um, cannot meet all of the needs that are out there. Just to give one example, um, the wait list for Section 8 vouchers is, is over 3,000 individuals long. Um, and then lastly, uh, the top portion of the graphic here, if you flip over to the other side of your printed paper, these are the seven recommendations or you know, ideas that are posed in the plan and kind of identify where they would make impact along this income spectrum. So again, this is getting at the idea that uh, we're trying to be strategic about housing policy and in being strategic, we're meeting needs along the entire spectrum. So at this point, I want to launch into a brief overview of what each of the concepts in the plan are, starting with land use regulations. So um, what this section of the plan does is it lays out a work plan for the city to make land use regulation changes in support of both housing affordability, but also diversifying uh, housing choice and um, creating more options beyond larger apartments and single family homes. Those are the two most common types of housing in Rapid City and we want to make more choices available as well. We have identified sort of a three phase approach for how to go about making these land use revision changes. Um, the first of which, this is sort of our immediate action that we take want to take, this is related to one of the two ordinances that I introduced at the beginning. And what this is, is to expand our options for an administrative zoning exception. So this strategy actually builds on a tool that we already have available to us. I'll um, just start by briefly explaining that. Within our land use code currently, there is a tool called the administrative exception. Um, and what that does is it allows administrative approval of minor deviations from the zoning district standards um, as a form of land use relief when if you were to have a strict application of the zoning code, it would you know, result in some sort of uh, practical or some other sort of difficulty for the property owner. And minor deviation is defined as 20% or less. So here's one example. Say um, you have a piece of property you want to develop for a commercial use, for example, and the code would require 100 parking spaces normally for that use. Now this lot in particular uh, has a irregular shape perhaps or some other site feature, so it's, it's not feasible to put those 100 spaces on the lot. Say it will accommodate 85 spaces instead. That requested deviation is less than 20%, so that's something you can apply for and have that reviewed administratively. Administratively meaning it's outside of a public hearing. So it you know, uh, expedites the process for the applicant and for the uh, bodies reviewing the project as well. So that's that 20% allowance that's currently in place, what this proposed ordinance would do is that it would expand that maximum from 20% to 40% if the public benefit is an affordable housing project. And again, definitions, in this instance, the housing, um, you know, the, the level of affordability would be kind of at this lower level here. Um, so instead of It'd be the same types of relief, so it could be parking, lot size, setbacks, building height, landscaping, parking, these types of development standards that sometimes can be tricky to make an affordable housing project pencil for the developer. We could provide an extra form of relief. And this would be a land use tool that would be used on a project by project basis. So like I said, this is in draft form already and something we'd like to bring back to the Planning Commission and the Council for consideration if there's support for this idea. So that's step one. Step two uh, looks, instead of project by project, this would look at either district-wide or neighborhood-wide changes to our zoning code in order to make small adjustments that could have, you know, uh, impact. So, for example, there are some discussions in place about creating a new zoning district for small homes. We're talking about reducing parking minimums creating different standards in order to allow missing middle housing or what you think of as like three plexes, four plexes, that, those kinds of housing opportunities. So, you know, we actually we have a list that's much longer than this, but those just a few examples of additional changes we could make essentially to our existing code. And then lastly, um, 
looking at our code comprehensively. So our zoning code was originally adopted in 1968. It's been updated and changed to meet needs and reflect changing development practices many, many times over the years. However, what our comprehensive plan talks about in much more length, if you're interested in it, is, is really a full diagnosis and um, update to that document. So that would be step three. That would be further down the road. But here's our sort of three uh, step approach to how we can look at land use regulations and support more opportunities for housing. Okay, that's item one. Item two is support of the Strategic Housing Trust Fund, and I will point out that we have representatives from the trust fund in the audience today. Alan Solano is the chair, and Dave Luss is the um, coordinator of this group. What this is is a newly uh, created funding tool that has the goal of supporting, um, you can call it workforce housing. So this is low income to moderate income households. And what this fund is hoping to do is to provide low interest or no interest loans that would be uh, on a revolving fashion, so returned back to the fund over time. So um, this program is looking at households, you know, with uh, medium incomes. You're talking about hospitality workers, of which there are many in Rapid City, child care providers, substitute teachers, um, hairstylists. You know, think of the people in your lives who you know who have these, you know, um, types of professions and some of the housing shortage issues that they're that they're facing. This trust fund is hoping to create opportunities for more development in the sort of workforce housing area and they are looking for city support in this. Um, the city has been involved in the formation of this fund and will continue to be involved kind of in operating and um, making decisions about how these funds are, are used. There are three city staff members who will participate on this advisory board, um, but the suggestion in the, in the plan and what we're hoping the council will consider is support through financial uh, financial means, so either with vision funds or a line item in the budget. Strategy number three is a concept for what we could call a rental registration program, and the main point of this concept is really about the exchange of information. Uh, this would be a way to create a network of landowners and property managers th through which the city or whoever ends up would end up being the managing entity could share information back and forth and to kind of have a better understanding of the rental supply in the city. Now, um, this type of idea actually was sort of tested already on a small scale during the COVID-19 response. There was sort of an ad hoc list of property managers and, um, and property owners put together in order to you know, help disseminate information about some of the financial information that was available. So we've kind of seen how that has provided benefits to the community already, but that could certainly be expanded on. Uh, there are uh, resources for property managers related to eviction mitigation, um, other training opportunities. There's just a lot of information that would be useful that could kind of flow back and forth if we were to have something like this in place. The way it's described in the plan is keep it simple. You know, location, number of units, contact persons. So we're not talking about overly cumbersome or invasive uh, you know, interviews here, but that's basically the idea is for the exchange of information. And to build on that, strategy four is something that could exist separately or in tandem with strategy three. And this is the idea for a proactive rental inspection program for the city. This would be a completely new program for the city, not something that could be absorbed really into what we already have going on. And I will say of all the um, strategies in the plan that are suggesting, this is probably in the earliest you know, form, uh, earliest stages of development, and that is noted in the plan. Uh, but what are we talking about? Okay, we're talking about basic life safety standards here. So does your property that you rent out and earn income on, does it have running water? Are you providing heat for your tenants? Is your property free of extreme mold and pests? Are there windows and doors in place? And do they lock so that your tenants um, have some sense of security, which everyone has the right to secure a form of housing? So, you know, that's really what this concept is looking at. and. There would be costs and benefits with this, as there are with everything. And so uh, looking at this further, if there's support for this idea from the community, from the council, from the many stakeholders that would need to be involved in coming up with something like this, there is certainly much more research that needs to be documented. I'll just say none of that research has happened to this point. This is really just putting the idea out there and getting some initial response to it. Strategy number five relates to the second of two ordinances that I mentioned. This is for a building permit fee waiver. So what this would do is create an ordinance that would 
allow the building services division to waive fees for some projects that are uh, involving affordable housing. It would create partners for the city to work with, including our own CDBG, Pennington County, um, and also the many programs offered by South Dakota Housing Development Authority. And it would say, if you have a housing project that's funded by one of these entities, you're automatically eligible to have your building permit fee waived. Now, it's important to mention that Rapid City building permit fees are really not that high. They haven't been increased since the mid-1990s. So the actual dollar amount really is not the most important part of this um, program necessarily, but what it does is it could help applicants be more competitive when they're applying for other state and federal funds. It helps to reward developers who are already working really hard to find other sources of funding and it helps them leverage those funds. And then, you know, at the broadest level, it really just sends a signal of support that Rapid City is friendly towards affordable housing developers and looking for um, more opportunities to partner. Strategy number six is uh, directly related to item number 37 on the agenda that you uh, discussed earlier, and that's looking at the important link between transportation and housing. So um, this really just kind of sets the stage or sort of tees up the notion that the city is going to continue to look at public transportation. And as part of that, we're gonna um, consider what the needs of um, those who rely on public transportation and, and have housing needs as well and the links between those. So more to come on that as the TDP is further developed over the next year. And then um, lastly, item seven is not in the written form of plan, but it's something we're considering adding into the final draft. And this would be to expand the role of our community development block grant program. Each year, uh, they distribute about $500,000 of federal funds to local projects, some of which are geared specifically towards affordable housing, pro um, affordable housing needs. So this concept is to say that if the city were to be able to put some additional funds into the CDBG program, we could further leverage those projects even more. There's already a great deal of technical assistance um, and you know, processes that are underway for CDBG, so a, a little bit of money really would help to further leverage those federal funds. So it's something to consider looking into more. So those are the seven strategies. I just wanna uh, conclude with going back to this graphic, just you know, trying to conclude by saying that housing is complex and for the city to be able to focus on the areas where we're gonna have the most impact is the most strategic way that we can move forward with housing opportunities in the community. Uh, the plan going forward would be to gauge the support for those two ordinances and bring those back to you as soon as possible and then also make revisions to the plan and, and sort of officially adopt that and then begin work on um, implementing other aspects of the plan that have the most support, including the uh, many forms of public engagement that need to continue to happen as these ideas are further developed. And lastly, you know, I wanna hear from you. What do you think, what are your questions? What would you like to see as we move forward with some of these ideas? Will you be presenting on this on Monday evening as well? I'm certainly available to. Okay. Do we have any questions? Um, or comments? Mr. Nordstrom. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Ms. Hansel, I want to thank you very much for all the time that you spent with me for educating me on the strategic housing. Um, one of the things I'd like to follow up on is uh, one of my suggestions at this point is uh, we're trying to uh, come up with a no deadlines yet uh, on the uh, Funding of the revolving fund. Uh, uh, what revenues can we put into the re revolving fund? And I'll go through my list real quickly here. Um, the other thing is the landlord tenant agreements that we have out there. That will also help us in the utilities uh, because we don't have a great communication amongst the uh, landlords and tenants right now. And it also would help us out in the area of. If, uh, if such another epidemic or pandemic comes around, this would be a great uh, avenue for communicating with the tenants so that if that we can help them avoid eviction through no fault of their own. Um, substandard housing is a very keen interest of me, for me, and, uh, and what that leads into is the uh, demolition of substandard houses if we need some more funding in that department or, or division, uh, let us know. Um, I'd like to also take a look at that because I think there's some more 
houses that are in this and within Rapid City that need to go away. And then uh, lastly, for me, one of the other areas that needs a little bit more education is on the homeless. But in reality, we've got a lot of people that are in the houseless situation. It could be an apartment to short-term housing to uh, uh, a lifetime experience having a home ownership. So that's my short list for today. So uh, and I'll uh, remain or stand by for any uh, comments, feedback. Great, um, Mr. Solomon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've had or Mr. Weifenbach. Pardon? Either, either or. Both oh, of you. <laughs> you go first. I have to leave soon, but I, I, I do, I do want to thank you, you and the committee for the work. Obviously, this is an important topic. Um, you know, Mr. Jones brought up here about being an umpire earlier. I feel the role of government is more umpire than player, and and, uh, and I think when we approach affordable housing, looking at things like land use, building permits, those kind of things, I think are helpful. Uh, through the vision fund process, I think we can work out whether the trust um, fund is the right move for Rapid City. Um, don't really have an issue with that personally. I, I can see the benefit. Uh, if I have hesitation on any of this, it is with three and four, and it is with the registration and the inspection. While it is well intended, I think it could have unintended consequences. Um, sometimes when we get big government a little bit, and that may not be our intention, but it can over time balloon up to such a thing that, that let's say repairs for uh, a piece of property that we want, you know, we don't want people living in substandard conditions, but obviously when we have that kind of proactive inspection going on, it raises the cost. Well, all those costs get pushed back onto the rent payer, and then it kind of creates this cycle and keeps the, the prices up. And I. I don't know how we uh, protect the overreach, perhaps, of government while at the same time protecting those who live in substandard conditions. And let me, let me say this, uh, not to tell my story, but I grew up living homeless. I've lived in crack houses. I've slept with roaches. I changed elementary schools 12 times, multiple states. I've, I've told my story before. I understand and I want every person to have a, as uh, Habitat for Humanity says, a decent place to live. I think that is, that is awesome. I don't know if that's the role of government, but I do believe that should be the goal of a community. And what, the go what our role can be in that is how do we eliminate barriers? How do we set those standards? But I, I get a little bit concerned with, the, you know, when we have registrations and kind of creating the government list and then the inspections. And, and even if it starts out well for a few years, my concern, if I have one, this is probably just political philosophy, is that it balloons and grows into something we didn't mean it to, and it has an opposite effect of what our hearts are wanting to do. Um, so that's my impression of this all along. Everything else, I think there's some really cool ideas, and we really need to look at the wages. Actually, it doesn't show that it's important in here, but economic development and creating uh, well-paying jobs, uh, creating conditions for those businesses to thrive and live here, which includes a lot of factors. I think economic development and incre increasing um, wages is actually an even better way uh, to address poverty because it's the economic development is the tide that raises all ships, so to speak. So there's just, I think there's a lot of interconnected things to all of this that, that simply addressing this won't really go to the root of the issue. It addresses the more of the symptom. And I think it is a, a solution to a problem, but I think a lot of folks are going to have to continue to work on how do we improve the economic conditions of this community? Um, how do we make it easy to do business, raise a family, go to school, uh, train talent for the future? All of those things are connected to this. So I just I thought I'd throw that out there out of fairness. It's not really a question for you to answer because it's like you have to change my mind probably philosophically, um, but that is kind of my hesitation. But everything else, uh, and I don't disagree with the solution. I'm just not sure how much the city should play a role in that solution. I guess that's my, that's my take. That's my two cents. And I'll yield. Thank you. Mr. Weifelbach, your turn. Thank you, Madam Chair. But, Sarah, thank you. Oh, 
like I've been trying to communicate with you a little bit on email and stuff to not to blindside you with the questions and uh, but I, I got to understand uh, is this a high level presentation or are there metrics and goals that are set aside I mean, we can talk about all the blue sky stuff we want I'm just wondering is there metrics and goals that are established in here somewhere that so we can or is this just a high level presentation that's yeah, no metrics specifically, um, so more to the, the first comment you made about being more of a high-level plan. Well, that's important to understand because there's, there's you know, uh, if we're talking about a high-level plan, yeah, that's all, I, I get that part. I mean, transportation, I mean, we just had a presentation earlier from our transportation department. Uh, are they involved on this, in this conversation because uh, they do a really good job and they can help. I mean, we've really spent a lot of time, and I think our public works and planning people here tonight can tell you how, how far that thing's grown and how, how good they are at capturing those issues of people needing rides or whatever. I mean, they'll come right to your house if you can call them. Uh, there was a set, you, you'd mentioned there was two ordinances that were like low-hanging fruit, and I, I didn't really catch what they were. The administrative. One, correct? Yep, the first is an administrative exception. It, it expands the role of our existing administrative exception. Oh, okay, okay. The second is a building permit fee waiver for certain projects. Yeah, and which I think a building permit we, we fee waiver is probably insignificant in the long run. Uh, when you're talking about medians and stuff in here here on, on housing prices and housing, what people are paying, I spent 30 years in the mortgage business and very seldom did I ever come across anybody who was buying a house that was could even meet that criteria at 28 to 30 percent. Um, I don't think we'll ever change that. I think it's something we're going to live with. But when you talk about the rental number, are you talking about uh, including their utilities in that number as a rent number? Yes. So if a median income is 1100 is 50 grand, that means 1153 dollars would be the median at 30 percent. That includes their, that includes their utilities and their rent. Yes, and it's difficult to achieve, which is why so many households in Rapid City are housing cost burdened, because they are paying more than that. Yeah, that, well, we've had an influx of a lot of people coming there and working out of their homes, so, I mean, that helps the wage part, but it doesn't really do a lot for the people that, are, that aren't getting wages, and there's, there's a, I mean, have the utility companies come to the table on this also? I think that's a big issue. Um, I can tell you from being a landlord, uh, making me register my homes is, is crazy. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's an idea here that doesn't even, for me, I can't even figure that into how that would make anything more affordable or having a preactive, uh, pre, uh, having a, someone come in and check out my house and see if I got running water. And when a person rents a house, they see what they got when they rent it and they know what they're going to pay to rent it. Uh, there's a factor of people that rent houses that has to come to, come to play in fruition here also, which is basically intangible. I, I, I would have a really hard time being convinced that registering my rental property when it's already registered at the state, they know that it's not owner occupied property. Um, and we also, have a, we also have a system in place right now for people. And this is to everybody who don't know. If you have a substandard house that you're living in, you can make a request to the city. They will go and inspect your house and they'll fill out a report. And that report will document that information because a lot of times that might not be real. So there is a system in place that we use right now. Maybe we can look at the system that we have and make sure there's some backbone behind it that we're actually doing some of the things and just instead of sending the guy out there to, you know, to just to do something and not have a, a follow up on it, you know, as a council, we can make those decisions to, to give more backbone into that process. There is a process in place if somebody, I mean, even at the state level, if you get on the, on the website, you'll find pages of information that have renters' rights, have landlords' rights. Uh, I would have to echo Mr. Solomon's comments that there's things the city should do, the government should do, and there's things the government shouldn't do. And this one, I, that one would be an overreach for me. Um, I had a couple other questions on the utilities was one. Um, the median income, when you talk about a household, just for the people that are here, she said the household income, 
median, that's the middle, in Rapid City is $50,000. That's obviously increased over the last few years. And that's a household of, say, four people? Right. So, um, the, average, the average household size in Rapid City is just over two. Um, two people but working, be, but... It, but it, it, that's sort of a different statistic. Okay. I mean, already South Dakota sets up people on failure anyway. If you have a, if you have a rental property versus a home, your own occupied property, on a basic house, you'd be paying about $50 more a month as a rental property. I mean, those, those are significant. I mean, if we want to look at really changing things, we should look at, you know, uh, lobbying the state legislature somehow to change that. But in the, in the long run, reality is, is things cost money. And somebody's going to have to pay somewhere along the line. Um, I just, uh, I'd have to understand, you know, as this thing goes forward, what, I just, I really can't get behind anybody registering a rental property and then having somebody proactively inspect it. I, I could see that, and we know, we guarantee that that will change. And if you don't believe me, ask some of the city employees that work here. They had, they had plans on certain things that were gonna happen to them, and they get changed. They know they're gonna get changed, and we're just, we're having a pipe dream if we don't think those things will change. So I appreciate it, Madam Chair. I'll do some more research on some of these things with Sarah, uh, but I wanted to get that out there right now for the rental property people that are going to be calling me and going to be emailing me and saying, you're not going to do this, are you? So thank you. Ms. Hansel, this is in draft form, correct? Yes. That, that's, that's a good starting point. And we appreciate the work that you have put forward. Um, and um, you just, you've given us more to think about. Do you have any questions or comments? All right, Ms. Hansel, thank you again for your work in the presentation. We do have one um, speaker request form, Mr. David Lust. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the council. I'll be brief. I am a coordinator for the uh, Strategic Housing Trust Fund, and we actually almost had a quorum here earlier with, with Vicki and Tom Weaver and Liz and Michelle and Alan and Sarah. So. Uh, that's a committee that does it, uh, has really put this together, and, and, and we've played a role in, in, in the wonderful work that Sarah has done, and I appreciate you, you, you presenting this whole plan. I just kind of want to give you an update of where we are and, 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 and respond briefly to some comments by um, uh, Ron and Jason on the role of government in housing. And I, I do not disagree philosophically with some of the things that, that were mentioned earlier. I think what we need to recognize, though, is when it comes to housing affordability, the government has imposed a lot of things on construction, land development, all these things that add significantly to the cost. So unless we can, and it's not, it's not just the city government, probably not even primarily the city government, it's at every level of government that these things get added on. So. I agree there is a legitimate discussion of what is the role of government in affordable housing. But as long as we're in the regulatory environment we're in and it has been created over the last 80 years, um, I think we need to focus on what can government do to equalize the burden they put on affordability uh, and the costs. And, and primarily and specifically to the Strategic Housing Trust Fund, the leveling factor is finances. And uh, I'll give you a brief update on where we are in, on the finances of the trust fund, just so you know. We, we took a big swing at the legislature this year for, house, for affordable housing. Um, and it would be easy to say we were unsuccessful, uh, just based on the fact that the bill we, were, we, uh, we introduced was defeated. However, and, and I'll ask uh, Representative Derby to speak briefly, uh, we made a lot of progress with legislators on affordable housing, and especially and primarily what we're doing here in Rapid City, which is unique and, and through this trust fund, we should be commended for. And we received lots of kudos from legislators. I, I think you'll see some action on that next year. But we were lauded because what we're doing is, not a, is really not at its, at its core a government response to affordability. We are, our, our board is made up of, of certainly city representation, but primarily non-city non representation and we're addressing this in a creative, unique way by aggregating funds from private sector and public sector. 
uh, to, to address it in a, in a loan-based manner. So these aren't grants. These aren't, this isn't money that flies out the door and it's never seen again. These are revolving dollars. And that's the uniqueness of, that we have in Rapid City that's not being done anywhere else in South Dakota and many other states in the country. So I think we've got a vehicle that is tailor-made for the city to participate in. In fact, several city employees are on the board. Um, but we need now the city's financial support. I'm meeting with county officials next week. The, there's summer studies on affordable housing that, that Representative Derby will, Derby will talk about, but we need the city to help us get this, this going initially, and, and that, that really is a financial commitment. And so uh, I will be beating um, that drum for as long as I can, and I've met with several of you individually, um, and I, I know that some of you have it on top of mind, and I, I would ask you to continue to do so. But I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Representative Derby give an update on, on where we are at the state level. Thank you. Thank you, David. Mike Derby, State Representative, District 34, Rapid City. And we did make a big swing this year. Uh, I think our time will be next year with the uh, additional one-time funds that will be coming to the state of South Dakota. I think we're well poised. I'm a, now a member of the executive board of the legislature, and we looked at 12 topics for summer study on Monday. We picked two, one is marijuana and the other is workforce housing. Okay. So we're gonna spend a lot of time uh, this summer on workforce housing. All this information is very valuable. We'll have our pitch together uh, next year and uh, I think we'll be successful on the one-time funds to answer uh, Councilman Nordstrom's question. Thank you. Mr. Madam Chair, it would be remiss if I didn't, you know, I spent a lot of time on the things I didn't like, but I agree that with earlier statements about uh, our employees and the Public Works Department, all these people, they, they know what they can and can't do to really affect the future of the community when we get into um, making decisions that are good on those projects. I have no issue, even I would go as far as 100% to trust that they would make decision that would lean towards that direction so I think that's a good thing but you got to have their participation they're the ones that understand if you do this this is going to happen so sometimes we get up here and, and, and you know so if we give them some more latitude with that I'm, I'm, I'm all for that I agree that that would be a good thing sure. and, and okay. cut the red tape okay. Mr. Nordstrom if I can just add on to Mr. Weifenbach's concerns that uh, in the recent past within the last two three years uh, we've been looking at the substandard housing uh, and the uh, cooperation or the communication between landlords and tenants 90 to 95 percent of the landlords and tenants within the city of rapid city are going to be fine it's that five percent that don't care that's what what i'm concerned about that need that attention all the way from uh, the list is never ending on, on those, that 5% that's out there right now. That's the group that I'm really worried about. The other, they won't, we won't have a problem with them. But it's just that, that line of communication that's available. Mr. Evans? Just want to comment and thank Mr. Derby and Mr. Luss for not forgetting the art of oration and how intelligible every word you said was when you spoke to us. I appreciate that bit. But back to uh, government always being, you know, the enemy or the problem or something. Government is also always the solution. And this problem has been around for thousands of years. It's not going to go away. And it's not necessarily local. It's not necessarily state. It's national. It's a worldwide problem. And, you know, it's got to be thought of as that way. And we're a cog in that wheel. Um, but I, you know, it's not, government's not going to be the enemy, it's not going to be the solution, it's going to be both of those. And so I, I appreciate what everybody is doing to try and solve this problem, because it is critical, and it seems to be getting more critical by the year, as you know. So I want to thank you for your efforts. Okay. And for those of, uh, those people that are watching, I believe all of the council members received these booklets from you? If anybody is watching, I have Liz Hamburg as a contact. All right, so um, we will continue the discussion on to Monday as well and on and on. Great. Thank you all for being here.
We'll see you on Monday evening at our council meeting. Thank you, Madam Thank you. Chair.